Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many overcomers we got in the room today? Three of them. I said, how many overcomers do we have in the room today? Well, by the blood of Jesus, that's who you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Say it out loud, I'm an overcomer by the blood of Jesus. Oh, and the word of my testimony. Oh, let me tell you something about that verse. You are overcomer because of the blood of Jesus and because of the word of your testimony. Your testimony in that verse doesn't mean, well, in 1952. 
God came into my life and he did something good for me and I'll never forget it. That's not the word of your testimony that that verse is talking about. The word of your testimony is every word out of your mouth that agrees with God's word. That's your testimony is every word out of your mouth that agrees with the truth. Remember when you go to court, you know, all you guys that go to court all the time and everything, you know, we bail you out of jail all the time. When you go to court and you put up your hand and you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, they call that giving your testimony. Amen? Amen. So let's just tell the truth this morning. Amen? Turn her mic on, would you? It just sounds all right now. Um, there's a lady, a very beautiful lady in the third row in like a peachish pinkish jacket. Do you mind if I just minister to you real quick? That song, Overcomer, God had me look up the definition of overcome, and he said that that song we did for you because of something that you'd been going through. He said the definition of overcome is to conquer, to vanquish, defeat, subdue, reduce, overcome, overthrow, mean to get the better of by force of strategy. Conquer implies gaining mastery of. He said, that is you, my daughter. That is how I made you. So you are not weak. Do not think for one minute that you're weak because you are not. You are an overcomer. Everybody stick your hands to her right here. Let's just declare this over her. You're an overcomer. Stay in the fight till the final round. You're not going under. Ooh. God is holding you right now. You might be down for a moment, feeling like it's hopeless. But that's when he reminds you you're an overcomer. say this over her too. Amen.
Well, if that's the way you feel about things, you ought to just celebrate it a little bit.
We're going to have more and more and more of the glory of God. We're going to continue to press in and worship. So I want to take care of a few things. We're going to receive our offering. But that's not time to take a break from worship. We're worshiping God in every part of us. Worshiping God with our hands, with our feet, with our mouths, with our pocketbooks, with our wallets. If you need a cash giving envelope, we're going to receive two offerings. This one is for the church. And the second one is going to be for Todd Bentley, not for his ministry, but for him, for his family. He comes, just simply comes. Doesn't charge anything, but Glory Bound's nice. We pay for their <laughs> flights. We pay for their food while they're here. We pay their hotel. But we're going to bless him real good. But this first offering is going to be for the church. church. If you need a cash giving envelope for the church, if you'll raise your hands, the ushers will bring that to you. It's for your cash giving and your credit card giving. I'm telling you, I've never seen better givers than we have at Glory Bound. Never. It's amazing. It's totally amazing. Everybody does their part, and that's a great and wonderful thing. One thing that we have testimony of, and Patricia King told me this, and every speaker has told us this, that most places they go, they get an honorarium. Well, we don't want to give them an honorarium. We want to honor them in our giving. And so we're going to do that. So if you only brought one offering today, you're not really from Glory Bound, then you're going to save it for our second offering, okay? So this first offering is for the church. Oh, you guys are brilliant. Said in Spanish, this first offering is for the church. Iglesia. Come on. You need interpreters or something? Yeah. Okay. And Dale, are we going to pass it for this or are they coming up? Okay. You guys are going to come up for this one. So if you're levantate, stand up. Esta, esta ofre aquí es para la iglesia. You know, we, we went to a place in Mexico that they cry every time they pray. And so uh, when they were taking their offering, they, oh, ofrenda de amor, ofrenda de amor. Okay, tonight we're going to, and they would come out of it immediately. So I'm not going to cry over this offering. We bless your offering and get around the people and come up and put it in the baskets that are up here up front. That way we keep them separate. Yeah. Yeah, they would do that. They would they would cry every time they prayed, and then all of a sudden they'd be out of the cry and right into, and next we're going to go here. So. If you're crying and you're giving your offering, I think it's a little opposite of what God wants. What do you think? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. You guys are cheerful, joyful givers. I mean, look at this. God, I don't know why, and you don't know why, but God honors us so much here in Albuquerque and so much here at Glory Bound. God lets us bring the greatest people in the world, Amen. the signs and wonders. Yes. We're not just bringing anybody in, and we could have anybody, and God would make it good, but we are bringing in what God is doing right now and partnering with that. Would you agree we're partnering with this? Yeah. And uh, I want Wyatt to talk for just a minute, and then we're going to go ahead and receive Todd's offering too. I want to tell you something. God honors us by bringing Todd Bentley and his family and his assistants in. God honors us. It changes the atmosphere. I want to tell you something. I don't know, just in the time that he's been here, something has stirred up on the inside of me that's going to transfer also to the inside of you. And so be expecting today. You know, Todd talked last night about uh, Revival Harvest America, which is basically just another way of... Uh, uh, the platform that God's kind of put on Todd's heart to uh, to do outreach in America, to do evangelistic outreach. You know, what we've specialized in the last, oh, even more than a decade is we've kind of specialized on ourselves. We've uh, conferenced ourselves up and we've received and received and received. And uh, But statistics show that, you know, uh, people aren't really from the outside coming in to the church especially here in America. The church is kind of holding its own, but it's not really growing, and it's, we're certainly not seeing the, the outpouring, the, the, the revival, the soul winning that, we, that we'd like to see. And, and uh, you know, everybody in the church is just kind of, kind of trucking along and everything, but, but we're scratching our heads. Well, how do we reach everybody else? How do we reach the, the folks that really, need, uh, that really need the Lord and don't know about him? Um, Todd's uh, got an idea from the Lord about doing stadium revivals, you know, uh, public stadium revivals. And uh, they did a prototype a few weeks ago up in New York uh, near Buffalo. And, um, you know, just, you know, you kind of got to, when God tells you something, you kind of got to step out in faith and learn how to do what he says and stuff. And so he's got another uh, thing planned uh, uh, 
actually next year in, in, in Los Angeles, and, and, and uh, we're going to be part of it. Um, I, I signed us. I signed us up. So I don't know what I don't know what that means. You know, I I, I have no what that means. We'll uh, we'll get us a we'll get us a forty five seat hot rod and go out there and and uh, pack it up and see if we can help out a little bit or something like that. But uh, I think we need to be in on this. Um, uh, there's there's a little complexity to this that, that actually involves Albuquerque. I know Bob Jones has a has a prophecy about revival up and down Route 66. And guess where Albuquerque sits? Right in the middle of Route 66. And uh, you know that's that's going to be part of something. I believe we're going to have a stadium revival here. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, Teresa. Turn my microphone on. I'm sure they didn't hear me. I said. I said, I believe we're going to have a stadium revival here. Yeah. And we know how. I'm an old rock promoter. I can set up a stage in a PA at, uh, at, 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 at the UNM Stadium over there. We can, we can do this. This yeah. is easy stuff. Yeah. Hallelujah. But anyway, I, I believe that we need to kind of watch and be part of, of what's going on here regarding revival because you know the church has got a lot of pent up energy we're seeing this even in the political realm and everything the church has got a lot of excess energy and 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 we're spinning it in some of the wrong places sometimes you know we're starting to bite at one another's heels and starting to gripe and grouse and you know when the children of israel did that in the wilderness it just meant that they were in the wilderness too long you know Let's get something to do, and if it's soul winning, I think that would be pleasing to the Lord. I think that would really be good. So anyway, um, when he talks about revival, harvest America, let's be let's let's kind of be part of the overall picture of not Todd's organization, even as much as God's organization, wanting to reach out and reach a generation that has not yet been reached. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Now, this offering, we're going to use our glory bound envelopes because we're going to give this as a gift to Todd Bentley. Okay? This is our gift to him. So if you need cash giving envelopes, do not use the envelopes on your seat. We're going to use that tonight or later, whatever Todd feels. This is a glory bound offering to Todd Bentley. Okay? Are you guys ready for this? We're supposed to honor the prophets. We're supposed to honor them and be good to them. I try to be real nice because I know that I'm going to get a prophet's reward. If you need a cash giving envelope, I want to bless Todd better than he's ever been blessed here before. Okay, This is real important that we partner in a way that lets him know how much we appreciate and how much we love him. We even let Jess even lets him come. That's pretty awesome. But next time, we'll make sure that Jess and the kids come. They're pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. I love this family. I love the hearts, and it changes everything in here. If you haven't been here in the last few meetings, you'll notice that the atmosphere is already charged. It's wonderful, and that's what Todd, he can bring it every time. <laughs> They're talking to me. I'm he sorry. can bring it. it. There's no one upstaging me, is there? I just want to make sure that I'm not being upstaged at all. Okay, make your checks out to Glory Bound, and we're going to give him one big check to take with him from Glory Bound. Make your checks to Glory Bound. Use those envelopes for your cash giving and for your credit card giving. And this time the buckets are going to be passed. That way we distinguish the offerings. Make sure you do it in a way that's worthy of the Lord. Do the best we can. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for Todd Bentley's ministry, for the future that you have for it, for the past of everything wonderful and incredible that you've done from right here, right now. And in the name of Jesus, I bless this offering that it would lead to life. In the holy name of Jesus, I thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. As they pass the buckets, make sure that you know that you're being a blessing and that your offering is blessed. Keep doing it as a worship. You know, Claudia, while I was up there, the band rebelled. Yeah. They wanted to play everybody this song, so let's, let's just do this. Okay, Teresa, would you turn on the computer? <laughs> and here we go. 
Oh, that's not it. Oh, let's do this one instead. Yeah. Yeah. I got a question for you. Who is moving on the waters? Who is holding up the moon? Who is peeling back the darkness? The burning light of new. Who is standing on the mountains? Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? Who's the lover of my soul? Tell me his name. Yeah, he is not. Creator God, 
Todd's been talking about this, and you know, I like to play songs before Todd talks about things. But he mentions this several times, so I kind of want to just reiterate this point. We are in a dispensation, among other things, which I would like to call the reconciliation of all things. Now, you know what? Just like most everything in the spirit, it's already here before we know it. And so sometimes we call our, we find ourselves calling for things that are already here. Well, that's okay. Let's just kind of get on the same page with this stuff. Amen. The earth belongs to him. Are we okay about that? Are we okay about that? The earth belonging to him? Oh, Brother Wyatt, you don't know what's going on out there. Oh, Brother Wyatt, you've got your head stuck in the sand. You should see the way the devil's doing this and the devil's doing that, and praise be his name. I mean, that's kind of the way we do sometimes. We give him a little bit too much glory. Jesus is Lord over all things. Say that out loud. Jesus is Lord over all things. Say it one more time. Jesus is Lord over all things. The earth belongs to him. The fullness of it all, it is his. The world, everyone, everything, all there is. All the earth belongs to him. All the earth belongs to him. When the fullness of time had come, he sent down his Holy One so the subjects of the law might be made free. So he could call us all his sons, yeah, so he could call us all his sons, restoration of all things is at hand, is at hand, that means right here, right now, restoration of all Restoration 
so reach out and take it now. Restoration of all things is at hand. Oh, believe and receive it now. Restoration of all things is at hand. Right here, right now. Restoration of all things is at hand, is at hand. I just want to speak right hand. now over your businesses. There are people that have lost some things in business, and I want to speak a complete and total restoration over your business. If you're in the red, if you've been in the red, even if you've already lost it, I speak a complete and total restoration over your businesses in Jesus name they things are going to break open for you and you're going to see an increase where you thought that there was no hope the Lord says "Uh uh-uh I don't think so I gave you the dream I gave you the desire I gave you the business and what I have given you let no man take away from you so I break that open for you in Jesus name And if it's already gone, it will come back and it will be even greater than it was before. That is God's promise for you. That is God's word over you. If you want that in your life, receive it today in Jesus' name. I also hear the Lord saying, I'm restoring family members. They're not gone. He sees exactly where they are. You need to call them back in with your mouth. Call them back in. Come on, I'm telling you. Open your mouth. Call them back. We don't lose not one. If they don't know Jesus, I guarantee you they will. You know why? Because God said he would save you and your So that means they have no choice but to bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. We call them back in, Jesus. Restoration in our family and healing and finances, everything. We want it all back. We won't back down. We talked about that this morning. We don't give up. We talked about that this morning. Do you hear what God's saying? There's kind of a theme. All right. Praise you, Jesus. There's a gentleman over here in, with the hat. Do you mind if I just speak to you for a minute? During that, during restoration, I looked over and you were just surrounded in orange. And so I looked up what that meant. And it means fire of God, deliverance, passionate praise. During restoration, he says, I am restoring your passion. And my fire is going to cleanse you so that restoration can and will take place and not just take place, but take hold. That and 9,999 9, other reasons. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>
worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy Just worship him this morning. Children, you are dismissed to Wisdom Word Warriors. I want to tell you something before we introduce Todd. The second time Todd came, we were at Rudy's Barbecue eating, and he said, I just want you to know I've come twice to Albuquerque, and I'm going to be going to other places, so this is the last time I'll be here. And then he got up and went to the restroom, and Mary turned to us and said, he is so wrong. He's going to be here over and over and over again. And, uh, and she said, you'll see. And then as Lakeland went on, uh, when it was in its prime, we talked to Don Perosic, who was working with Todd at the time there. And Mary said, yeah, we're going to invite Todd to come here. And uh, Don Perosic said he will never come to Albuquerque again. He just won't do it. He's, they're going to be doing these different meetings now. And uh, Mary said, oh, no, I've seen him in the spirit. He's here. And, uh, and so that was really cool. And then another time when he came, my daughter called me and said, God has a word for you. Stick close to Todd. Always be supportive. Always be supportive of his family. Always be a friend to him because God will make you as family. And you'll be able to see him again and again, and you'll be able to help. And so I'm telling you as a church, we are family. We are friends. We are family. I, I love his wife. I like her more than him, but he's great too. You know, he's great too. And so, with that in mind, <laughs> please welcome Todd Bentley. My, uh, thank you, thank you. My wife wishes she was here and sends her greetings. She's home with the little babies. Of course, we have a brand new baby princess in the house, little Paris, or actually Jocelyn Rain Bentley. And uh, I've got five now, you know, four daughters, one son. So I wanted to be Father Abraham, had many sons. I turned out I had to have many daughters. My oldest is 22 now. And, uh, you know, all my kids, my older kids have all graduated. And seven of them are co starting college this year. And so my 18-year-old son and 19-year-old daughter and 22. And then I have little uh, Paris. She's three and a half. Uh, you can imagine how hyper and how active. Uh, and uh, especially any daughter of mine, you know, she takes on the evangelist in me. And she's very... Uh, outgoing, and then uh, we just had a new addition this year. She's six months, uh, little Jocelyn Rain Bentley, and so uh, Jess is nesting, and she sends her greetings. She said, if I was going to get it on the road and go anywhere, the place I'd want to be is New Mexico with our glory-bound family and friends. So that's the truth. So Jess is uh, uh, with us in spirit here today, and uh, mom is in town, of course, from Sacramento, and, and uh, my wife is half Korean, and so my mother-in-law is from Seoul, Korea, and I'm, I'm a big, you know, Asian kind of food kind of guy, so mom's in town cooking all the Korean barbecue and, you know, all the great stuff, and, and so, uh, but we are blessed, you know, um, you know, I had my family attend the Revival Harvest America Stadium Crusade a few weeks ago in New York, and they do get out on some trips, but not as much as they used to. 
Uh, hopefully, we'll be in California in November, and I'll have my family out there with me there. But uh, I'm so excited and blessed to have the team that I have that usually travels with me. Uh, you know, when I come here, of course, it is family. It is home away from home. And so I just bring my assistant along. And I have a great assistant, a great personal assistant that many of you have yet to meet. And uh, she's up here in the front row hiding. Uh, you know, Leslie Moss, would you just welcome Leslie? Just go ahead and wave at the people. Yeah, I catch her on her phone all the time playing video games when I'm preaching, and I, I, I say, it's okay. I say, it's okay. You're more saved than most of us, and she grew up a uh, pastor's kid in, in Columbus, Ohio. Our mom had a church up there and then won a scholarship to our ministry school a couple of years ago, almost three years ago, and uh, came and did our ministry school. And then my wife and I just kind of adopted her in and said, hey, you need to come and work and do the book tables for us. And she's now moved into our home and moved in with our family and become an adopted, uh, you know, a part of who we are. We do kind of really look alike. <laughs> you know, just... It's 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 really funny. I don't I don't see a lot of other African American you know out here you know as much. But uh, it's funny when we travel because you know I'm bald and tattooed and people see us traveling around and you know it's quite funny, especially when you're down in the South. You know we're down more in like the South Georgia South. You know and so we always get the the weird looks and uh, and uh, I you know somebody actually one time went up to Leslie and said uh, you know asked if she was my daughter and really thought you know the resemblance was quite striking. You know, as far as her and I being daughter, you know, father, daughter. It's a, I was like, well, praise God, she really does look like me, doesn't she? You know, it's just, the skin color is really what, you know, stands out the most, you know, hallelujah. But uh, anyways, we have a lot of fun. And, and just so, you know, uh, doesn't trust me with a whole lot of people, but she trusts me with Glory Bound and she trusts me with uh, Leslie. And, uh, you know, so great joy to be here again. And, and, and this weekend has been so power packed. Listen, Friday night, uh, you know, things got opened up in the spirit, talking about heavenly realities and how to pull down heaven and release the substance of, of, of heaven. And we talked about all kinds of supernatural stuff. And then last night, I don't even know what we got into, but wow, we had some fun, <laughs> I'll tell you. And uh, this morning's going to be great. Tonight, we're going to have a special uh, double portion, a literal double-double uh, anointing service tonight. And we'll get out the oil, and we're going to have fun and do impartation, activation. And uh, I've had this word right now about the double portion, and literally double portion mantles. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit and uh, have a blowout Holy Ghost party tonight and pray for healing and whatever the Lord wants to do. But you don't want to miss the anointing service at 7 o'clock tonight. And then uh, have a bookstore as well guys and I do want to go out there tonight maybe after the meeting we pray for everybody and you're all blasted and bombed in the Holy Ghost uh, I'm gonna you know step into our bookstore tonight and I'll sign some of the books I brought uh, a lot of the soaking CDs I'm gonna do this up front because when I start preaching I want to be able to minister right out of the glory and so I'm just gonna mention a couple of the resources who is here today for the first time you missed the weekend Friday Saturday you just able to be here this morning I'm glad you're here we're going to be ministering to you this morning for sure. Some of you can't be here tonight as well. So uh, I want to have lots of time for laying hands and ministering here at the altar and releasing the anointing. And sometimes I think the encounter with God's presence and what we receive from the Holy Spirit is even more powerful than just the message of the teaching. And uh, I do love to preach, guys. And so I can go on for two, three hours and uh, prophesying and preaching. It's never just preaching, but bringing the prophetic. And so I've got to kind of rope it in a little bit here so we can have lunch and then come back for tonight's meeting so I've asked my assistant to you know give me the the key when I hit that 45 minutes or so so I can be at least transitioning to laying hands on people and praying and prophesying and ministering and whatever the Lord wants to do especially for those that aren't going to be here tonight and so if you missed out on the last couple of days I'm sure they have recordings on Facebook live and other places you can get the messages um, but we do have a book table and I did bring a few of my newest resources of course I've been featuring and talking a lot about the new study guide the new workbook I have uh, uh, it's called The Secret Place. It's a workbook study guide, interactive prayer journal. You can write down your dreams, encounters, visions. And uh, I do take you on a journey into the secret place through the workbook. And uh, we have a lot of, you know, life application, reflective questions uh, for you journaling, hearing the voice of God and experiencing God in the glory. So that's kind of one of my newest resources I never had here last time. It's the interactive prayer journal study guide. And uh, it's a companion to my newest uh, best-selling book, The Secret Place. 
which is the book I wanted to write 20 years ago when I first started talking about The Secret Place, and it's become my life's message. And so I do detail a lot of my testimony when the glory liquid honey cloud came and how the Lord launched and called me into the ministry by raising me up in the secret place of his presence, which started with an encounter on Mother's Day weekend, 1998, when the glory liquid honey cloud came. Some people have heard me reference in parts of my testimony, you know, Mother's Day or the glory liquid honey cloud, four to 12 hours a day in the glory, and they You've heard me talk about soaking or marinating. So a lot of that's in here, but I do have a lot of teaching on like mystical prayer, contemplative prayer, listening prayer, how to experience the intimacy with God you've always wanted, talking about um, experiencing the manifest presence of God. And so this has a new workbook study guide. And uh, a lot of people that have the secret place don't have the workbook and study guide. They didn't have it last time. So you want to check out the secret place collection. Um, it's endorsed. Bill Johnson wrote the endorsement for it. Uh, Rick Pino and Rick Joyner and find out why all the guys love the secret place. And there are some great keys in here that'll help you draw closer to the Lord. And, uh, you know, I do talk about third heaven encounters uh, that I was able to get access to revelation because of intimacy. I share all those secrets as well as secret place of the stairs, the blessings and benefits of the uh, secret place. I talk about the father's house going into nine rooms in the spirit, the bathroom, the dining room, the rec room, all my classic teachings on soaking. What is soaking? It's all in this book. So, I want to give away this copy to people that haven't been here this weekend. Uh, we got a big church crowd. This uh, lady right here, you'd like to have a copy of The Secret Place? Let me just give that to you real quick and say thank you for coming, and may the Lord bless you with closeness and nearness and manifest presence. And uh, So a lot of people think they're kind of okay when it comes to prayer and intimacy, and then they read the book, and they go, wow, i got a long way to go. And so that'll spark a revival hunger in you guys. But that's 20 years of my journey, and the Lord only had me release it last year. I think we've had to reprint it five times now, going to print my sixth time, and uh, so the workbook came out, and that's been in, in stock I think three times already as well, so it's a, a real need in the church right now as people are hungry to have intimacy with God. So you want to check it out. You'll probably forget everything I said by the time you get drunk later. So that's why Leslie and the people that are in the bookstore can help you uh, with the Secret Place collection. And so I am promoting that. Um, I was blessed this morning, really blessed. We have a young lady in our church. She's only uh, 15. So when I say young lady, uh, you know, and I don't know how many brothers and sisters she has, but she helps out with our baby a little bit. But it's great to see teenagers hungry. So I get on my Instagram, you know, this morning, and uh, and, and I'm going through my Instagram, and she's like 15. I'll about 16, you know, you know, teenagers are, I'm close to 16, you know, they want to be older, you know, we want to be younger, and uh, she posts on her Instagram a picture of my new book, uh, Every Day with God, which is a supernatural daily devotional, every day, 120 days, you know, experience God in the supernatural, so it's Every Day with God, and she posted on her Instagram this morning, said, I woke up early, like 6 a.m., so I could have devotions, and, uh, you know, this is my favorite book right now, helping me encounter God every day, and for a 15-year-old teenager to post that, that she's up early, and uh, our book is making her hungry for God, and she just takes a little devotional every day. Uh, we start on Holy Spirit, how to know the presence of the person of the Holy Spirit every day in your life for 30 days, and then we go into how to experience the kingdom in miracles every day for 30 days. Then we go into angels for 30 days. Then we go into healing for 30 days. So it's going to be a 365 day devotional. So this is the first volume every day with God and uh, you will live in the supernatural every day. So I want to bless somebody that has just here this morning and had that chance. How about this gentleman right back here? You'd like to have uh, uh, the devotional? Yeah, right here. Come on down. Come on. Give the Lord a mighty shout for that. Thank you for coming this morning. Enjoy that. You know, when you go to the bookstore, don't just think of yourself. Think of gifts. Think of people that you can be a blessing to that maybe don't know our ministry or our teaching. And, and it's one thing to hear. It's another thing to read. And, and I have, I think, eight books we've authored now and never considered I'd be a writer because I got a grade eight education, no business degree, no GED. <clears throat> and so to, uh, you know, write a few books, you know, I thought maybe one day and, you know, I never believed all these years later we'd have eight and I'm working on three new book projects right now. And uh, a lot of exciting things happening as I feel like the Lord is saying to take the resources, 20 years of ministry, and put discipling, equipping tools in the hands of people. Uh, and books is one way we do that. So uh, this is not one of my newest books, but it is fairly new in the sense that not a lot of people have uh, the kingdom revelation. I love to teach on how to make the kingdom of heaven real, how to manifest and move in miracles, how to declare the kingdom of God and see it manifest in your life, in your family, in your home. We break it down, we make it practical, and yet we talk about taking cities and nations for God. 
We talk about stadiums, casting out devils, moving in the mantle of deliverance, kingdom signs, how to recognize the signs of the kingdom. And, uh, you know, it's a throwback to the power evangelism days of John Wimber. So if you'd love to have a little bit more of the kingdom exploding in your life and making heaven real, uh, most of you probably do not have the classic kingdom rising. And you want to have it because kingdom invasion is coming this year, how to invade cities for God, how to take nations for God. So kingdom rising is going to be the first edition, and that's available in the bookstore. This is an equipping series on deliverance, authority, power, signs, wonders, and how to preach the gospel in places like Africa, Pakistan, and around the world in stadiums. So it, it's a little bit of a power evangelism school as well for those that want to grow in the ministry of the prophetic and uh, power evangelism, harvest stadiums, miracles, casting out demons. So uh, it's a little bit of a kingdom manual. So I want to give away a copy of Kingdom Rising. Anybody on this side of the room want to have that here? Can I, this lady right here, you'd like to have a copy? Let me just bless you with that. There you go. So check out all the stuff, guys, in the bookstore. Uh, you've heard me quote Bob Jones a lot. How many of you have heard of Bob Jones? Let me know who knows the legacy. Okay, who's never heard of Bob Jones, the prophet, the seer prophet Bob Jones? Okay, most in the room are familiar. And you've heard me reference some of his famous prophecies, like the billion soul harvest, uh, the sands of time, uh, the fisherman prophecy. Bob has a lot of famous prophecies. Some of them are decades old that are just manifesting now. And some have never had the chance to sit under Bob so I actually recorded Bob and uh, why he was going into the heavens. And I would sh record his prophetic encounters. And we mixed a bunch of music where Bob was sharing supernatural experiences. And I was sharing some encounters and Stacey Campbell, Lou Engel, some other prophetic voices. And we recorded it in such a way that you're going to experience the open heaven. And you're going to go into the spirit. And, and the spirit of prophecy is going to be something that's transferable. So a lot of people don't know about Open Heavens Volume 1 and 2 because they're very rare supernatural encounters of the modern-day prophets today. So this is more than a soaking worship prayer CD. This is an encounter CD. It's not teaching. It's music, and you get to hear Bob and Stacy Campbell and Lou Engle and the other prophets. So they are on iTunes. A lot of people don't know they're all on iTunes. I think I have eight or nine marinating, soaking-type CDs. But I'm going to give away this special Bob Jones classic, Open Heavens Volume 2. So anybody celebrating anything big? Bathroom, you know, dining room, uh, anniversary, dining room, anniversary, uh, you know, who wants to eat? Hallelujah. Uh, birthday, anything big in the room? You got a birthday or something happening? Come on up, let me bless you with this. Open heavens. There you go. God bless you. Come on, give the Lord a mighty shout. Yeah, I went on a little longer than I usually talk about books and products, but a lot of you didn't get here for the weekend, and we got a different crowd probably than we'll have tonight even. And I want to have people have a chance to check out the resources. You're getting more than knowledge, uh, but you really are receiving a lot of impartation, 20 years of stuff I've learned in supernatural ministry, and uh, you'll be surprised how deep and meaty the books are. If you think how deep and meaty the preaching is, I only got a handful of teaching series out there, but mostly soaking music and marinating music. I'm working on a new project right now called saturation you know how many of you know i did the series of soaking marinating cds like soaking in the secret place prayers for the manifest presence and then i did marinating pickling in the present it's time for volume three to go with the secret place collection so i'm coming out with saturation prayers for full immersion holy ghost immersion prayers for holy ghost immersion how many of you want to get saturated so it's a new uh, soaking classic today it'll go with marinating it'll go with soaking and then we'll have saturation and it's amazing. I sold 100,000 records. I tell most musicians that, and they're like, 100,000 records? I said, that's just soaking. That's just the first CD. And uh, I got nominated for a Dove Award. I sold so many records. I got invited to the uh, TV, you know, where they give out one of those music uh, rewards. I got invited to be a part of that, and I sold 100,000 records, and I don't even sing. I'm not a musician. <laughs> and they go, how do you sell 100,000 records and you don't sing? They go, what do you do? I said, I soak. He said, what do you mean that you soak? I said, I go into the glory, and there's music, and I encounter God, and that anointing drips off onto the CD, and other people want to capture that and go into the secret place, so they're hungry for the glory of God. That's how I sold 100,000 records. And they said, no singing at all? I said, nope, just praying. Just laying on the floor in the glory, going into heaven and praying, and we got some music. And then I even took the, the prayers out because my voice became distracting, and I said, I'm going to do one without prayers, and then boom. And uh, became a viral, you know, CD for people. And then I thought, wow, I've never believed nine years later, ten years, I would have like eight CDs. And I don't even know how to play a chord on any instrument. I'm the most untalented guy. 
And our newest uh, CD is a worship experience, and it's pretty amazing. I even attempt to sing a little bit about the honey and the oil and the wine. How many love to drink the honey and the oil and the wine? You just you don't know what the honey is? I'll take it. Hallelujah. You know, I want the wine. I love the wine. That sounds good. And, you know, I love the oil. Who didn't love the oil? Hallelujah. So, Lord, release the honey and the oil and the wine. That's I've been meditating on that for almost a, a year. I was in a revival in Canada and uh, started out just a weekend. I went for 30 days in, in Alberta. I was in Canada and uh, Edmonton, you know, a lot of oil wells. And during one of the meetings, I got snackered, snockered, Heidi Baker, thank you, uh, wasted in the Holy Ghost. Can I just say that? I, I mean, I'm talking by the end of ministering and preaching, giving the altar call and praying for healing. I got hit in the prayer lines, trying to lay hands on like four or 500 people at the end of this meeting. And I got so drunk. I just started singing. I didn't care what anybody thought about the new wine. I started, you know, feeling fine and drinking the new wine. And I just started getting more and more filled with the Holy Ghost joy and, you know, drunken glory. And pretty soon I busted out with the honey, the oil, the wine. And anyways, two hours of the honey, the oil, the wine. And everybody was drunk on the honey, the oil, and the wine. And revival erupted in this, you know, building. And we went for 30 days. And then I moved from that location to another place outside of Toronto in Hamilton, Canada, and had a glory awakening revival, like almost six months of signs, wonders, miracles, deaf, blind, cancers, wheelchair, like miracles in Canada, and they called it glory awakening, and I almost stayed for six months. 2,000 people got saved on the streets, all came out of the honey, the oil, and the wine, being absolutely snockered and drunk in the Holy Ghost, and then revival breaks out, and uh, 2,000 people are saved, and we go into glory revival, uh, glory awakening, and so... Uh, that was a very transferable anointing. How many of you would love God to hit us uh, and just pour out the honey, the oil, and the wine? And if, and if God just, you know, literally uh, invaded your life and turned it right side up, and uh, you got so hit with the power of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it broke out into the move of God. And so that's what came out of all that crazy drunken party and joy, which seemed like a lot of crazy manifestations. And then it birthed the full revival on the honey, on the oil on the wine. Lord, pour it out this morning. Can you just lift your hands up and say, God, I want the honey. Honey is revelation. It's Jesus. Honey from the rock, I'll satisfy you. Honey, I want to taste and see that the Lord is good. So God is letting us taste the honey. For those saying, God, I want the honey cloud. I want to taste the honey. I want to taste the honey liquid love. I want to taste the honey presence. I want to taste and see. Honey is revelation. It's Jesus. Release that sweet, sweet honey. Lord, let me taste that honey. Whew. Jonathan ate a little honey. His eyes were enlightened. His countenance was enlightened. He took a little honey from the lion's carcass, remember? And it says, Jonathan, the loyal, faithful, you know, friend of David, took just a little honey from the lion carcass. All you need is a little honey. And then we love the oil, don't we? Because it's the new oil, it's the power, it's the ministry, the blessing, the favor, the Holy Spirit, the oil. How many of you know right now we are celebrating the new wine and the oil? Literally today. We're in the seven days here of celebrating one of the greatest feasts in Israel, the end of the harvest cycle. I think it's the third big harvest feast every year. It's the Feast of Booths, in gathering the harvest of all things that have been planted, the restoration of all things. So we're celebrating right now a seven-day uh, you know, festival. It starts five days after the Day of Atonement, and we go into the Feast of, of Ingathering. It's the second most holiest day because we're celebrating all the harvest that God has given us, and we're celebrating with great joy and we're celebrating with great uh, anticipation that the next cycle of harvest is even going to be greater the next Pentecost and the summer harvest and then the big fall harvest starts five days after the day of atonement so we entered into that Friday night at some point while I was ministering we entered into the evening of the seven days after Rosh Hashanah after the day of atonement five days after that holy day which I think was Tuesday September 18th uh, Friday night around sundown we entered into a very specific time in the spirit, understanding times and seasons. And in the spirit, as we've come into the Jewish New Year, 5779, and we talked a little bit about that, uh, we've also crossed over now into the greatest season of harvest, celebrating the season of harvest. And so I want to honor that. But the Lord visited me in a very powerful way here uh, Friday night, you know, in between the, you know, 3, 4 a.m. in the middle of the night, Friday, Saturday. The Lord visited me in a very powerful way as the Lord of the harvest. 
And I, I shared a lot of that last night, so I don't want to unpack that. But I had a visitation from the Lord here in my hotel here in Albuquerque. And I didn't realize it was the eve of the Feast of Booths or in gathering. I had no idea it was on that time. And uh, the Lord got my attention. He said, do you know what time it is? I said, what time is it, Lord? He said, it's time for the banks to overflow. And what happens when the Jordan banks are overflowing? It said they only overflow during the harvest. During the entire season of harvest, the banks will flood. That's Joshua 3.15. Now, if you all remember the Feast of Booths, it was a celebration of remembering coming out of the land of Egypt, living in tents in the wilderness, you know, those 40 years so what does it really mean when we're remembering the Feast of Booth? It's, it's a celebration of the harvest of all things in the harvest season. But even beyond that, it's remembering how God provided for us in the land of Egypt, living in the land of Goshen, and then brought us up out of the land of Egypt. And we survived 40 years, you know, 40, 40 years when you think about it, how the provision of God, the blessing of God, the favor of God uh, in, in the desert. But then when you get to the end in Joshua 3, when you really think about what they're celebrating is they're celebrating the fact that after wandering in transition around the same mountain, God enabled them to cross over the Jordan, new day, new vision, new anointing, and cross into possess the promise the Lord God gave them to possess. So it's a remembrance that we're not in a place of transition anymore. How many of you are, are highlighting Joshua 3.15? You're not in a place of wandering and transition. 2018, coming into the new year, you're crossing over. That's really what Joshua 3.15 was about. And that the season that God chose for the crossover, and to inherit the promise, your inheritance was the season of harvest when the Jordan's banks would overflow uh, itself. And so, you know, I wouldn't have even caught what time it was if I didn't have the encounter in my hotel room where I wake up and I'm like in a trance. So I know I'm awake. I know I'm in my hotel, but I'm, I'm, I'm taken to the banks of the river and I'm seeing how the river is going to overflow its banks. And the Lord starts speaking to me about the floods of God's spirit and the harvest Hand in hand, God would pour his spirit like floods on dry ground, pour his spirit out like water on him who's thirsty, release rivers in the desert. And you know the whole river of God, Ezekiel 47, gets deeper the further it gets out from the temple. It's not ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, but a river that's so deep. Well, the river at its deepest part in Ezekiel 47 becomes a river of what? Harvest. Fishermen alongside of the banks of the Enkedi. So I literally saw the Lord with a net, and he was casting out this net. And I knew it was Albuquerque. He was casting out this net. He said, I have a new net, a new harvest net, supernatural uh, harvest net acceleration. And this anointing is here. And it was like uh, Jesus as a fisherman. And he was handing out this uh, net. And it was awesome because it was heavenly. The vision I was having, uh, the Lord, you know, was very heavenly, very translucent. It was almost like seeing a ghost, white. And even the net was kind of a white with a blue. And I knew it was a heavenly thing, but yet it was a very natural thing. And the Lord said, the banks are going to overflow. The floods are coming. And that's the Spirit of God. Floods mean Holy Spirit, outpouring, downpour, revival. When God pours the Spirit out like floods on dry ground. So I'm not talking a negative thing. We got floods in the Carolinas from Hurricane Florence right now. And literally we're flooding in the Carolinas. We're taking that as a prophetic sign that the banks are going to overflow. And we're coming into a great harvest, okay? But literally... Uh, I believe in America, we're going to see at the same time like a flash Holy Ghost. I love the flash floods of the Holy Spirit. They're suddenly upon you, and you don't just have ankle deep, but you're in a river so deep you can't cross, but you have to swim, and you're gone from a river of life and healing to now it's a river of harvest, fishermen alongside the banks. And so here's Jesus, and he's throwing out this great net. He said, I've got the net fixed for Albuquerque for the harvest. And uh, I noticed when he kept giving out the line, the net, uh, it never, it didn't have any end or beginning. The net didn't have any end or beginning. The net just kept going. He said, it's the harvest that never ends. How many are ready for the net to bring in the harvest that never ends? What does the Bible call the harvest that never ends? The harvest at the end of the age. When they thrust in the sickle in Revelation 14... Revelation 14 is the fulfillment of Matthew 13, seven parables about the harvest, and uh, the eternal everlasting gospel will be preached. How many of you know that the eternal everlasting apostolic gospel is being preached and revealed like never before? And the, and the angels called harvesters thrust in the sickle, right? This is when the goat nations, the sheep nations, the wheat and tares grow together. One last great harvest. And nobody knows whether that'll be a 50-year 50 50 season or a 100-year season, but there 
will be a great future harvest, one, one called the harvest at the end of the age. It's a future kingdom harvest, and it's very different than Pentecost, which we started the church with 3,000 saved, then 5,000. That was Pentecost. We've yet to move into the fullness of apostolic kingdom, and we really are starting to understand things about the kingdom right now and preaching the eternal everlasting gospel. But I believe that the future harvest, one last great harvest, if not you, your children's children, will be alive for that harvest. I'm preparing a generation now of, of last day harvesters before the return of Christ. And wherever you want to put your end time eschatology or rapture, what you go ahead and do that. But I have my conviction that it's going to be darker and yet the coming glory of God, the contrast between light and darkness, and we're going to be in the light. And so we're going to have no fear. It doesn't matter how dark, deep darkness, arise and shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So I've been talking a little bit about this heavenly encounter I had with supernatural harvest and acceleration, and I saw the Lord of the harvest giving out the net. And I was quite surprised in Albuquerque I had that visitation because this was the kind of visitation where I immediately came under the presence of God. It was very holy, and I'm having an encounter with Jesus in my hotel room uh, in Albuquerque. And the Lord says, what time is it? I had to look it up and find out that the Lord was trying to get my attention about this five-day window. He goes, I visited you on the very night, on the evening. I thought maybe the Lord would come, you know, in the 10 days of awe, Rosh Hashanah, the Day of Atonement, like all the other prophets, Bob Jones, Bobby Connors, they get all their shepherd's rod revelation. You know, there's a, a window of revelatory things that tend to happen for a lot of the prophetic people I know, friends of mine. They get all their revelation for the Jewish New Year and, you know, whatever it is. I got nothing. And then the Lord visits me here, and he says, hey, it's five days after. And, it, and it's sundown, and I'm visiting you because of the harvest. I'm here to talk to you about the anointing that's being released for the fishermen, for the harvest, for the great net that's going to uh, not end. And then I saw how the Lord was giving out this net. It really did remind me of an old Bob Jones prophecy called the Fisherman Prophecy where Bob saw a net at Morningstar and he got up and was talking about this fisherman, this net, and harvesting nations. And a man walks in that morning in our church, you know, at Rick Joyner's church then in Morningstar, and this man walks in with a massive net in the middle of Rick and Bob Jones doing their Sunday morning. A guy comes into the church, looks like a dirty fisherman, and he carries right into the church service an old fisher-like net, and he drags it up to the pulpit and says, excuse me, Rick Joyner, Bob Jones, and Bob's bringing his famous fisherman prophecy, the net, where he talks about harvesting the whole world and uh, talks about how the Lord was giving out shoes. He had this vision during his fisherman prophecy. The Lord was giving out different types of shoes, different types of sizes. And shoes, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring glad tidings, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. And he said in this vision, when the Lord threw out the big nets and the harvest was coming, he said the Lord kept giving out shoes for feet, shoes for feet. And he saw like Nikes just do it. And he saw all these different brands of shoes. It wasn't just one type. And uh, people were putting on shoes. Some had angel wings on their shoes, flames on their shoes, different types of anointing and mantles. But it was all evangelism based. And these shoes were feet going into all the nations of the world. And why Bob was sharing out of Ezekiel 47 about the banks, the river at its deepest point, the further out from the temple the river got was when it became a river of harvest, went from life and healing to a river of harvest. And then the, the fish fishermen were throwing in their nets. So Bob was sharing in great detail his net, his, you know, the net that works, the networks of churches apostolically that were going to come together to throw out a net that would work, not any one church because it's in the cluster. He said the net was not a broken net, didn't have any holes in it, and it was a great unity amongst churches that were apostolic. There were nets, and there was this net that worked that brought in the harvest, and then all, out came all these shoes, and uh, people were getting a custom fit shoes for their feet, for their call, for wherever it was they were going to go and uh it was a very awesome prophecy. And so how many of you believe the Lord right now is anointing our feet to, to run, to go? Ask me and I'll give you the nations, I'll give you the heathen. So uh, that came alive in my spirit when I saw the Lord here giving out the net. And I started to pray, God, give out the nets for Albuquerque. Give out the nets. Let it begin here. A harvest that would not stop. The net went on so much beyond any one place. And I said, Lord, you're doing this now. You're giving the church an ability and a favor to get out the nets to harvest the fish. You're putting new shoes on our feet. And what's the timing of all this? When the banks overflow its river, that's when the harvest happened in Joshua 3.15. 
And as long as the banks of the Jordan overflowed, the harvest happened. And Lord was speaking to me about harvest and floods, harvest and floods. 2018 being the year of outpouring uh, uh, breakouts of the Holy Spirit. That's why so many people are doing stadium events and, and striking right now. We're in a divine moment and a window I believe we haven't seen in many years. Some would say decades even of fulfillment, fulfillment of unfulfilled prophetic words, visions, and dreams, that it's a time to possess. And uh, I've talked a lot about crossing over the Jordan, possessing the promise in times past, but the Lord is really highlighting to me uh, the window of, of time we're in as we come into the new year, 5779, of course, being a double portion year, double seven. It's a very unique double portion. Five is grace, grace for the double portion. That's the Hebrew year. And, and this year actually is symbolized by two things. I talked about the woman's womb. Um, it's like a womb, supernatural womb, and there's a light manifesting in the womb. That's the Hebrew picture for the nine. In the 5779, the picture, Hebrew, uh, would be of a woman's womb. So the idea is that the Lord is manifesting and bringing new light uh, to where things have never been birthed before. People have never carried this. Uh, Isaiah 66, can a nation be born? The whole idea that uh, we're bringing forth a new beginning. So that's the, the highlight just practically of the, of the insights into the new year. But um, another word for this month is uh, the word for vision. And it's a double portion time of vision. There's an open vision thing, and God's breaking the attack on our vision. And literally, as we come into the new year, uh, it speaks of two things, the open door, the open vision, and it speaks of the new birthing, the light manifesting in the womb. That's kind of the prophetic picture for the uh, 5799. You know, it isn't amazing how God's calendar has all the pictures, uh, and he's prophesying through the, the every year. And if you follow the calendar over the last, you know, years, you can really see a prophetic things even happening and manifesting in the church connected to God's uh, seasons. And that's really what the uh, feasts are about, are God's season. I'm not here to preach on all the feasts because I'm not an expert in any way on any of the feasts. I just love the fact that we are in and transitioning into the greatest season of harvest. And, uh, and I believe, wouldn't it be like the Lord to use this window in this time to download all this stuff on us? Uh, and so the month is a, a vision month. And uh, I, I've seen the Lord since we, we were moving into this new season, um, healing eyes more than ever, like 17 testimonies of people healed of blindness in the last three weeks, you know, 26 days, 17 testimonies of blindness healed. And uh, I talked about my eyesight being healed, being legally blind on Father's Day morning, my eyes popping open, and the Lord healing my vision from a rare incurable eye disease called Stargardt's. And the Lord prophetically told me there's an attack on vision, the seers particularly. And, and the seers are important because the tribe of the sons of Ishakar were the seer tribe. They had the understanding of times and seasons. And they knew what Israel should do, how they should do it, when they should do it, and be very strategic. I think a lot of people in the church today are not tuning in to the times and seasons. And I'm not even talking about the corporate kingdom Israel times and seasons. That's not my anointing. I want to say, how many of you know you have a specific time and season connected to your mission and mandate, and uh, the Lord wants you to not fail, whether it's taking you 40 years or 40 days he's committed to getting you into the land of promise he's committed to fulfilling in your life every unfulfilled prophetic word vision and dream so I wanted what I really wanted to get to is this season is going to be a season of acceleration of you seeing not one or two but many of the of uh, unfulfilled prophetic words in your life who's been contending for decades or years believing for your city or believing for your mantle your anointing or your destiny how many of you are ready to hear Hear the Lord say, hey, in three days, this is Joshua. He went through the camp, and he told everybody in three days, after 40 years, the, all the words of Moses are coming to pass, guys. In three days, we're going into the land of promise. Forty years of waiting, desolate, dry wilderness. In three days, we're crossing over. Now, imagine what it would have been along. You want to talk about the buzz amongst all the people? You mean we're the generation after 40 years? And all the words to Moses and Joshua and Caleb were, were like going in. Like you can hardly believe after 40 years of waiting for the promise. How many of you have given up? It's been so long, five years, 10, 20, 25. It's like how do we after all these years believe for our city? And all the prophetic words that have come and all the guests and all the ministry. Well, imagine the Lord showing up in Joshua 3 and saying, hey, it's the end of wandering and transition. You know what time it is? Harvest time. And now you're about to cross over into the new day, the new vision, the new anointing. And uh, I'm about to enable you to receive 40 years of all the words of Moses. That's about to happen to you. And, and in three days, you need to be ready for the total change of your life, 
and, and the fulfillment of promises. And so that's what I love about this new year is God is speaking, the, the 5779, the light manifesting in the womb. He's speaking about this being a time of manifest light. You can only carry an expectation for nine months or a season before you must give birth. How many of you are ready to give birth to whatever it is you've been carrying in expectation? The womb of your spirit has been carrying and contending for the promise. So that's why it's so important right now, the light manifesting in the womb, as the Lord is speaking about, if you've been barren to give birth, Isaiah 66, you're not birthing the promise. It's coming to the time of delivery, but you're not bringing forth, right? And so there's a whole thing about the birthing woman right now. And that's why we need to pray for our womb, to birth, to have new seats, to have new vision, to have new. Um, and let me say it this way, because we're celebrating the, the end of the harvest season for the year, as Israel prepares for the next season, let's call it the new planting. How many of you would love to see the new planting of gifts, anointings, mantles, uh, commissionings, mandates, whatever it is, and you're just ready to do the next thing, to cross over? And so the interesting thing about um, the harvest of all things is everything that was in the field had to be reaped. But remember Ruth? When Ruth was with Boaz in the beginning, she only reaped the corner. She was poor, living in the land of leftovers, and here's Ruth with the reapers and the harvesters. And uh, Boaz, of course, gives the command that even though Ruth is, isn't, you know, we're going to give Ruth favor, and you're going to give her the full reaping. She's not going to reap the corners. She's going to get out into the whole field and reap the field. There's a big difference between first fruit Pentecost, one corner of the field, and that's a prophetic, God's going to bless my land, and I'm going to bring in the whole harvest later, right? So only after you brought in everything that was in the field could the field be ready for the next planting. Some of you have not had the next planting because you haven't harvested everything that's been in the field. So you can't get to the next harvest cycle. You can't get to the next planting. So I'm prophesying to you, you need to say, Lord, my bread, I cast it on the water. It'll return to me. There cannot be one seed in my last season that has not been harvested. You have the right to believe that it's harvest time and that anointing is, is moving forth in power now to command everything in your life that's been seed to manifest so everything in the field can be harvested so you can have a new planting. How many are ready for a new planting? To plant and operate and move in things you've never planted, operated, or moved in. You must believe this is a time of birthing, regardless of how barren you've been that God's going to bring forth the manifestation. So when did this happen? It happened in Joshua 3.15. There's so many prophetic things, To The bank was overflowing its banks, the Jordan. When did the overflow? In the time of season. And only when the time of the harvest do you see the banks. So get ready for the church to see a new flood, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit simultaneously as we see the greatest release of harvest. But more than anything, God is speaking about this particular time, and he's saying, remember how I brought you out of the land of sin and judgment, the world. Remember how I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Remember how you dwelled in the tents in the wilderness, and I brought my provision. And remember how I brought you into the land of promise. And so we need to remember today that God is able even after our own stubbornness sometimes and murmuring and grumbling keeps us from a 40 year it was only supposed to be a 40 day journey 40 years of delay but God was so committed he made sure we got in it didn't matter if it took 40 years you're going to get in to the land of promise and you're going to take your double portion uh, inheritance and so that's a lot of what I've been getting as far as uh, download from the Holy Spirit is how we need to position ourselves and I wouldn't have even noticed if I didn't have the visitation Friday night in my hotel in Albuquerque where I literally woke up in a trance and there was the Lord and he said I got the net and I'm bringing this harvest net and I'm, I'm about to bring us into a season where we're going to see the net and we're going to harvest more in that one small window. You'll do more in one day than you did in six months. The days are coming, saith the Lord, where the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, the one who sows seeds. How many are waiting for the day of acceleration where the laws of seed time and harvest are accelerated, the laws of increase are accelerated, and the days are coming, Amos 9, 13, where the plowman will overtake the reaper and you won't be bound by waiting for harvest seasons and cycles. If anything, these feasts represent more than, you know, anything, a shadow of the true heavenly copy. We must be able to draw prophetically on what all this stuff means. Somebody said to me one time, well, I'm not an Old Testament guy. And I said, well, there's a difference between Old Covenant and Old Testament. God is in the Old Testament. He's not in the Old Covenant. The whole idea that the law is done is the Mosaic law, but the Old Testament's not done. 
And the biggest change between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Old Testament is the testament of transaction. You do this, I do that. It's like a barter system with God. Where the New Testament becomes kingdom and family. Abba Father. Daddy God. And there's a big change between the Old Testament of transaction and the New Testament of relationship. And people are like, well, you know, the father just seemed to get over all of his anger and rage between the old and new. And I love the New Testament father, uh, the image that Jesus brings of the way that the father really is. And somehow we can't rectify the old covenant God. And so, and we get the old covenant, Old Testament mixed up when the law's done, the Mosaic part, but the Old Testament's not. And Christians need to get in their Bibles again and understand that the feasts have more meaning than just trying to do all the feasts. Like seven feasts of Israel. And Todd, are you one of those go back to Israel kind of guys? So we're the new Israel. And that's my belief more than anything as a, a grafted in Gentile. I'm the new Israel of God. And I barely had any love for even looking towards Israel as a sign. Back in my old prophetic days, my pastor didn't have any love or value for anything Israel. He was such a literalist that we were just as Israel as the Israel of God, that there was no need to look to even Israel. And I said, I feel like there's a truth in that, but I feel like you're missing something too. I said, I, I still feel like we need to have at least some honor, even though we wouldn't be an Israel of God type ministry. I, and I never studied the feast for the first 10 years I was saved because I thought they were old covenant done. The feasts of Israel were not, you know, connected to those times and charts. And the Lord said, yeah, but those are my seasons. The reason I do those celebrations was, was a whole lot more than the, the, the natural obligation, you know, to the letter of the law, so to speak. And but the spirit behind what those times and seasons mean, I'm very much into that. So you need to know my times and seasons. You need to know the anointing of the sons of Ishakar. How many of you heard me on Friday night talk about how the window, the time we're in right now, coming into the Jewish New Year 5779, is also uh, coincides with Ephraim, which means double fruitfulness. The month uh, is Ephraim as we're coming into this season. So double fruitfulness, double harvest. It is a double portion year. But uh, the amazing thing, Shoo, man, I feel a wave of glory coming down. The sons of Ishakar. I talked about the threefold cluster, the anointing being three. How many heard me talk about the cluster Friday night? Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim. Joseph had the adopted tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. So what is that all about? The Joseph means what? Blessing, favor, prosperity. It also means increase. I'm going to add, you're going to grow over the wall like a fruitful vine. So I love Joseph. You know, you want to talk about marketplace, the storehouses, blessing, distributing wealth, money, Joseph, right? But Joseph had Manasseh. Manasseh is an important thing to receiving your next season. Manasseh means God has made me forget the pain and the affliction and trauma of my last season. Because you'll never embrace what God is about to enable you to walk in if you can't forget the pain and trauma of your last season. So Manasseh and Ephraim means double fruitfulness. So that's a threefold anointing. Well, there's another cluster of anointing I've learned to love. And it's connected to the seer tribe, Ishakar, who had the understanding of times and seasons, what Israel, how they ought to do it, how to position themselves to receive the breakthrough and the blessing. So they were a very valuable tribe called the seer tribe and uh, the tribe of the sons of Ishakar. And so I've been teaching on that tribe, teaching on how to see in, in the seer tribe. And one thing I noticed is there's a great cluster. And the cluster comes from how when they would go to war, God would say, Judah first, praise, right? And Judah would go first. And it was really that way. And sometimes you see Judah and Gad. One of my favorite, the least of these tribes, was the tribe of Gad. They had the warlike faces, uh, like lions, and they were feared. They were warlike. The tribe of Gad, the least smallest tribe, had more fear in the camp of the enemy. Here comes Judah, and here comes Gad. Watch out, run. Because these are the most fierce, warlike faces like lions. Okay, the tribe of Gad. And uh, so Judah would go first. And then here's how would they would move to war at times. Not every time, but here's one of the formations. It would be Judah, and then it would be uh, Zebulun. How many of you know the tribe of Zebulun? Nepetali, Zebulun. Do you know what it means? The wealth tribe. The tribe of money and wealth and resource and, and uh, you know, the blessing of the economy of heaven. Money. They were the wealth tribe. And it's kind of important if you're taking cities and building cities and, you know, taking land, that you have a tribe that's got money and wealth because you want to be able to have economy. Hallelujah. So that was the tribe of Zebulun, okay? And uh, the wealth tribe, the money tribe. After the tribe Judah and Zebulun came the third tribe, and the third tribe was called uh, Ishakar. And so isn't it amazing that God would connect the ministry of the prophetic, the seer, and revelation to money? Because like the Levites, they're one of the least to be provided for. 
the Levites were the only ones that didn't have an inheritance. So they got a portion of everything, like a tithe, because they were the ministry of worship of the word. Well, the seer tribe, very similar. And so they wouldn't have access to their own. They weren't a money-making kind of tribe. So they were dependent upon Zebulun, the wealth tribe. How many of you know God is connecting the worship and the praise and the victory that comes out of praise, the triumph that comes with praise, Judah, and uh, he's connecting that with a great release of, of favor for resource, Zebulun, money, and he's connecting that to the seer anointing. That is the threefold cluster of Judah and uh, the Zebulun and um, uh, Ishakar. How many of you want to see that anointing released in your life? You want God to release a new anointing for praise, and God inhabits the praises, so it really does open up the heavens and, and the courts and uh, sets the atmosphere, but then God sends in the wealth. He sends in Nebula, Nebula, and then he sends in the seers. He sends in the Ishakar. So like Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim, you have uh, Judah, and you have um, the Zebulun, and you have the seer tribe of Ishakar. So get ready for those that are seers and those that are praying to be seers. This is a, a year of the open door and open vision. The attack that is on your vision is about to be broken, and a new seer oil is about to be poured out so that you can be a seer. But with that, revelation and engaging revelation doesn't work without praise. And yet God wants to connect a favor, a money thing, with the Judah and with the Ishakar anointing. God wants to release the tribe of wealth and commerce. That's really what they mean. Zebulun was the tribe of commerce. And they were able to move a lot of money and a lot of trade and a lot of stuff. So how many of you would love to see the Lord unlock a new financial favor for those that would be prophetic seers and watchmen on the wall? He's about to release a new Judah anointing of praise. He's releasing the Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim clusters, these threefold anointings. So this is some of the recent revelation that I've been getting from the Lord. And, uh, you know, I'm really feeling like uh, we're to prophesy today the new beginning, the birthing, that there will be no more delay, that there'll be no more uh, delay for the promise, that there'll be no more barrenness or miscarriage, uh, that the unfulfilled prophetic words, promises, visions, dreams are coming to pass, that this new light is going to manifest in your womb because you're saying, God, I'm ready to give birth to the new beginning. Hallelujah. And uh, the books are going to be closed on the old season and uh, the books are going to be open for the new season how many of you know the books closed on the day of atonement and and it was determined what your destiny would be for the year after 10 days of rendering your heart returning to the lord examine me try me be sure my name is in the book and, and i don't want to be in that other book you know i want my name to be in the book of life okay and it was a a, a reflective time for israel in these 10 days coming into the the new year was a reflective time from the feast of trumpets the feast of revelation blowing trumpets of revelation blowing in your face god opening up the windows of revelation 10 days of awe day of atonement five days later we're in the feast of booths and we've just come into the jewish new year so there's a, a moment here for us to position and even pull down from heaven the favor that's being commanded right now. How many of you know God's going to do things in honor uh, of, of the times and seasons and he has chosen for over 5,779 years to honor from the first day of creation his calendar not ours. So we need to get the prophetic insights and position and partner ourselves with the prophetic insights. And those are the two biggest prophetic insights for this new year is it's going to be an open vision and it's going to be a light manifesting in the womb. Those are the two prophetic insights, uh, you know, that you can build on out of 5779. I don't pretend to be a Chuck Pierce or some expert on understanding and pointing out times and seasons or some other teacher on the festivals, but I do have ears to hear. And, and you know, the Lord told me one time, he said, you're an evangelist. Um, people that usually don't see, see your evangelist. I usually don't see William Branham prophet, supernatural evangelist. And the Lord's been after restoring that mantle to the church, the prophet evangelist for a long time. And I said to the Lord one time, am I a teacher evangelist, pastor evangelist? Am I an apostle evangelist? And he said, you are, but you're an apostle, but you're a seer evangelist. Your gift mix is very unique. I've made you a seer equally to your evangelist. Most evangelists that you would call evangelists have nothing to do with the seer. They don't understand flags and worship and watchmen and prophetic encounters and angels, and they for sure don't really talk about it. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't see uh, Rodney Howard Brown probably get up and talk about the seers. 
That doesn't mean he's not anointed and doesn't believe in visions. It's just not his thing. You probably wouldn't have seen Billy Graham. You probably wouldn't have seen Reinhard Bonnke get up and go get all the flags and let's dance and go to the third heaven. You get that in the Patricia King meeting or a Doug Addison meeting or, you know, hanging out around Bob Jones and some of the other seers. But, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, depending on your prophetic camp, you might get Bill Hammond prophecy and that's going to be more knobby. It's not going to be seer. And then you get around the James Gall and all the seers. He wrote a book on the seer. And uh, I struggled for many years because I was a stadium evangelist, miracle signs, one millions. I'm going to go into all the world and preach the gospel in the biggest venues and reach millions for Christ. I'm an evangelist. Hallelujah. And then God came and said, here's a prophet's mantle. I said, what do you want me to do with this prophet's mantle? He said, hang out and travel with the prophets. And I did for years. John Paul Jackson and Don Potter and Paul Keith Davis and Rick Joyner and Bob Jones and Mike Bickle. And I did all the big conferences. I wasn't even 25 years old. I spoke for Bill Johnson and Cheon and Mike Bickle and John and Carol Arnott and every major conference in America. Some of them had thousands, you know, preached with Chuck Pierce. And I was amongst all the prophets. And yet I was doing these crusades in Africa, Rwanda, Congo, Nigeria, like stadiums, hundreds of thousands, cast in Odebans, heaving the sick, and evangelists, my first passion, reaching people with the gospel. And then the Lord goes, I'm going to make you a seer. Third heaven encounters, activate your spiritual senses. Lights, colors, and sounds, encounters with Jesus in the middle of the night, trances, and you're going to teach on all this stuff. And I said, God, I don't want to teach on dreams and visions. I don't want to teach on the supernatural. I'm an evangelist. I want to win souls and go into all the world. And people would come to me, and they'd say, hey, man, just be an evangelist. Cut out all that stuff, talking about the angel and, you know, Bob Jones and Paul Kane. You brought him to that stadium in, in Florida. Just, just get away from some of that stuff and just stick to the evangelism. You'll do better. And I tried. And the Lord said to me one time, he said, I was preaching, mid-preaching, and I was being a little more careful, conservative, a little bit more uh, evangelical, you know, Billy Graham, and preaching the gospel. I'm going to maybe start talking, not talk so much about supernatural things, you know. And uh, I literally was in a meeting one time for Rick Joyner, and I was preaching. It was all evangelism, healing, really safe, missions. And then the Lord came and said, hey, I didn't call you to this ministry. I'm like in the middle of preaching my message, and the Lord said, I didn't call you to this ministry. I called you to the ministry of the supernatural. He said, you know, you believe in Jesus. Even the demons believe in Jesus. You need to hear what I'm about to say because I get in a lot of trouble for this statement if you don't hear it in context. What I'm not saying is I am not saying do not preach the gospel. What I'm not saying is do not not preach the word. What I'm not saying, okay, but the Lord said this to me. He said, you know what the church needs? People to talk about the supernatural and to talk about the angel because if you don't make it normal, it's this idea that we have to have an apologetic all the time and, you know, I'm sorry for, you know, seeing the Lord. I'm sorry for having this encounter, this dream, this vision. And, 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 and he said, you need to be bold and you need to tell the people about the, the Lord. You need to tell them about the angel. You need to tell them about the supernatural things because that's when the supernatural is going to show up. And it was, I said, well, Lord, I'll just preach the gospel. And he said, that's great, but even the, uh, the, the demons believe and hear, you know, believe the gospel. They know Jesus. He goes, the church needs the gospel. Don't hear what I'm not saying, but what the church needs is the kingdom of God is not mere talking, but power, 1 Corinthians 4.20. Where is the power, not just the talking, the knowledge? He said, who will demonstrate the Spirit of God? Who will bring a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power, not just talking and preaching and theology? You know, we need all the doctrine. But And the Lord started to rebuke me. He said, if I wanted you to be this, I wouldn't have given you the mantle I gave you. Your ministry will be done today if you don't embrace the reality of the supernatural. I didn't call you to just be evangelical. I called you to have a no-compromise love for miracle signs and wonders as you preach the good news of the gospel. And so I've always considered a, a, a hybrid of the coming together of, of Oral Roberts. I love Oral Roberts as a healing evangelist, and I love Billy Graham as an evangelist. I said, could we see the healing harvest mantle like together and really believe that we can have both? That we don't have to choose. Like if you're going to be evangelical or if you're going to be miracle signs to wonders Pentecost, like you have to choose. And the Lord said, I'm about to release new types of ministries with the prophets and the evangelists. And these are the prophet evangelists. You could call them the spirit and power of Elijah if you want. He was an evangelist, turned the whole nation, all the hearts of a nation back to God in one day. And, and, and John the Baptist came preaching the message of the kingdom. And he, when he was preaching, he came preaching in the spirit and power of Elijah. The type and the forerunner for Christ and the whole message of the kingdom was John the Baptist. Well, the Bible says he had the spirit and power of Elijah. Clearly, he wasn't Elijah. How could a man thousands of years later have the same anointing Elijah had? 
That's what happened in Luke 1. John the Baptist was recognized by moving in what Elijah moved in. And he wasn't a miracle worker at all. John the Baptist had no recorded miracles. Repent, baptism, message of repentance, the kingdom message. John the Baptist wasn't involved in signs, wonders, and miracles, not even the way Elijah did miracles. Elijah was a signs prophet, so was Elisha. They were miracle prophets, raising the dead. And they were signs of wonders. And, and Elijah called down the fire, right, the victory of Mount Carmel. But it said the whole nation turned back to God in a day. Every heart in Israel was turned back. The hearts of the children get turned back to the fathers. And, and you know, when the Elijah spirit and anointing comes and the hearts of the, the children, the fathers, the daughters get restored to the father. And God breaks the curse that's over the land. He restores the land. Brokenness, marriage, relationships, healing, reconciliation. That's the, the Elijah spirit, right? And so John the Baptist comes. Now, how many of you believe that the spirit and power of Elijah, it's a prophetic spirit. It's, it's a fire. God's releasing a company of Elijah-type prophets, right? right now. And this new emerging company of Elijah type prophets are going to do signs and wonders, not just prophesy. Do you know what prophets have become in the church today? Get honest. They prophesy. Or they teach on prophetic church stuff, government stuff, prayer, intercession, uh, not even a whole lot of personal prophecy. You expect when you say the prophet is here in the house, you think you're going to get a prophetic word or the church, somebody's going to get a prophetic word, right? Prophets prophesy. What about prophets that are obligated to do signs and wonders like Elijah and Elisha? Where are the prophets that want to do signs and wonders and miracles? Where are the prophetic evangelists? Where are the seer evangelists? Who said you can't blend different types of anointings and mantles? Who says we can't pray for a double portion of the Oral Roberts healing and the double portion Billy Graham harvest mantle to be released to the next generation? And so the Lord dealt with me because when he, he anointed me, my first mantle was an evangelist. And then like three years in, he says, I'm going to mantle you with this second mantle. And I thought, I didn't even know you could have more than one mantle. And then he goes, here, I'm going to give you this prophet's mantle. And you're going to be a seer, not a knobby. I'm going to even change the way you prophesy. I'm going to make you a, a seer. And I thought, a seer like Rick Joyner, Bob Jones, like all the seers? He said, yep, and the greatest stadium evangelist. I said, boy, you don't even meet many like that. You'd have to go all the way back to like William Branham's days where he was as much supernatural in the prophetic, signs, wonders, and miracles, and stadiums and harvest and tents. You know? So the Lord really is restoring the supernatural ministry of Jesus. He's restoring the prophetic mantle, and he's restoring the mantle of power and healing and miracles, and we don't have to choose. Let me, let, me, let me end it with this encounter I had a few weeks ago. And it really surprised me. I went to this tiny church in Salem, Massachusetts, the witchcraft capital. You know, and uh, I went to this little church to preach on a Sunday in New England, in Massachusetts, Salem, not Oregon, Massachusetts, witchcraft capital. And they bring me into this little church, and I'm getting ready to get up and speak. And all of a sudden, I hear an eagle, like, the noise of an eagle, really loud. And so I turned the look, and the eagle was inside the church. A white eagle with blue eyes was inside the church. And it was the most beautiful, majestic eagle I'd ever seen. Pure white, uh, purity, holiness, righteousness, blue, like transparent blue eyes, like open skies. And, you know, blue means open heavens, Holy Spirit, revelation, uh, the seer. And white is also wisdom, purity, righteousness. And so I was, I was totally amazed at how white this eagle was. And it really spoke to me of maturity. Like these are the new mature eagles. Now, how many of you know eagles, you know, the prophetic? But there's apostolic and there's eagles that are wisdom. And I heard one prophet write about the eagles that were gold, eagles that had gold. And I've seen eagles with gold. But I've never seen such a beautiful white eagle. And uh, the Lord said this represents purity and righteousness and uh, holiness. And uh, this is a new generation of, of prophets that are being mantled on the earth right now. And, and these are going to be uh, in, in, coming from the eagle's nests. And uh, I said, I'd never seen such a white eagle, and, and it's wisdom. I know it's wisdom, and I know the, the blue, and I was drawn to the eagle's eyes, open heavens, Holy Spirit, revelation, the seer. 
And uh, he said, I'm going to release a new company of prophetic people that are going to be more concerned about how they get the process, the process of revelation, how they receive what they receive from the Lord. And uh, it's going to be on a higher level than what we've been used to even in the last 20 years of what we might call the restoration of the prophetic movement, the apostolic movement, and a lot of prophetic ministry. He said, most prophetic ministry today is, is more along the lines of how God speaks. The most common way that God speaks in the Bible is what? Dreams and visions or parables and dark sayings. The idea that we interpret, uh, you know, what does my dream mean? We have a lot of teaching on the understanding of dreams, visions. Uh, we want to understand, you know, all the prophetic su stuff, you know, and we want to interpret because, you know, the Bible says you get revelation, but you still have interpretation and application. You get revelation, you still have interpretation and application. Most of the church is, is, is after the spirit of revelation, but not the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We're after the spirit of revelation, but not the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom is how to rightly apply knowledge. What, what good is all that revelation if you don't know what to do, when to do, and how to do? And you got to be able to go beyond just having an encounter and be able to bring that to people in a way that they're going to receive and benefit from the impartation, not just you sharing the experience. So I always have the encounter. I give a historical context, and then I'm always, you know, I share the encounter, and then I go into the application. That's kind of my how I break down uh, prophetic stuff. I break it down as uh, revelation, and then I go, what's the interpretation? And then I go, what's the application? I've always done that. So even in my heavenly encounters, waking up to Jesus in the middle of the night in my hotel room, I want to give the historical, you know, uh, you know, background and hi historical context, and then I want to go into this was the encounter, and then this is what it means. Because what, what good is it talking about all our revelations when we have no wisdom? So God was speaking to me about a new prophetic company that would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. They would know what to do, when to do it, how to do it. You know, Ephesians 1.17, Paul prayed for not the spirit of revelation. He prayed for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What Solomon asked for was wisdom. And so the church needs to begin to seek wisdom for the prophetic. And the Lord said, I'm going to have a, a, a company of prophets that are going to be more concerned about the process, how they receive their revelation. So, you know, uh, the, the need for understanding your dream or your vision or your encounter. He goes, there's going to be a new clarity. I'm speaking about a new clarity. The pure crystal river is flowing, and it's a river of knowledge. And uh, I'm going to enable a new company of prophetic people that love worship, that love the glory, that love purity and holiness. I'm going to allow them to operate uh, uh, as a, a new emerging prophetic voice. And part of the new emerging prophetic voice is not the echo, not the regurgitation, but I'm ra raising up true prophetic voices again. Voices crying in the desert. True Kim Clement prophetic voices. Very real gifts. It's like we have hundreds of prophets and maybe one true prophet. I, I doubt all the thousands of prophetic people all over Facebook and all the prophetic words on every list you read on the Internet. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of prophetic. But I call it the gift of prophecy. Not the office of the prophet, not the spirit of prophecy. And I'm saying, God, if you're going to mantle and you're, and you're talking about the emerging prophetic voices, who wants to be a voice, not an echo, but I want to be a pure voice. And, and how important it is to be a voice today, not a regurgitation of what you learned from James Gall 20 years ago. Most prophecy today is just a regurgitation of what you learn from Patricia King or the Elijah List or the Internet, and we're just regurgitating off what we learn from being in events or conferences or books that we've read. Not That's not necessarily bad. But thank God for refreshing voices like Sean Boltz, who I knew in the prophetic for 20 years. Relational prophetic person, Sean Boltz, Kansas City all days. I've known Sean since God called me into ministry in 94. Sean spoke for me 20, 30 times. And he always was prophetic, relational, had a great word for people, but encouraging. But he was not Sean as we know him today, who has clearly got an upgrade, his gift, his word of knowledge gift. And he has become a recognized worldwide, on the level of, of, of statesman, governmental prophet that is amazing to see happen. A lot of people have only been following. Oh, we know Sean Boltz. You've only known him three or four years. Because most people just didn't even turn their head. But now, everybody kind of goes, dude, how do you know all those details? You call out people by name, date. He names all your kids, all their birth dates, your date, your birth. So amazing, most amazing, prolific word of knowledge gift. And then I have another friend of mine, Charlie Champ, and he is a governmental prophet, and he is like a Kim Clement. He is probably one of the most accurate, never-missed-it guys I've seen yet. 
and he's calling out who's going to be president, what day it's going to happen. He's predictive in his prophetic. He's not just a word of knowledge. He is predictive future, and he's not missed it. Headline news kind of stuff. And so he's an emerging guy, but he's a miracle guy, like signs and wonders, miracles and the glory, and like Elisha and Elijah. Lord, so I'm going to have these company of, of prophets, emerging prophetic voices that aren't going to receive their revelation just by a dream or a vision or a parable or a dark saying. But Moses, how did he get his revelation? Face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. Is it possible that we can go beyond just the need to interpret, here's a dream, here's a vision, here's a parable, now you need to try to figure out what it all means, to literally face-to-face -face revelation? Is there a higher level of revelatory? And I believe you can get it by dreams and visions, you can get it, but I believe you can get it from the face of God. And revelation that comes from standing in the light of his face, his countenance, seeking the face of God is a different kind of revelation. It's like Abraham, shall I hide from Abraham, my friend? We're going to bring judgment to Sodom and Gomorrah, but maybe we shouldn't until we talk to Abraham. So it's amazing. Uh, the Lord was speaking to me out of Psalms 24 when I saw the white eagle. He said, that's Psalms 24. I said, why? He said, it's, it's a call to ascend the holy hill. Clean hands, pure hearts. Who shall ascend? Who shall stand in the courts of the Lord? But he who has pure hands, pure heart. You know what the Lord said to me one time? He said, you have some of the purest heart that I've ever met. Because I was struggling. He, he was pure hands. And I thought of all the ways that my hands and my heart weren't pure. Every inappropriate thought, every battle in my thought life. And I thought, I surely don't have a pure heart, Lord. I could probably work on a lot of holiness. And he said, yeah, but it's a pure heart. He goes, do you think David had a pure heart? And I mean, the murderer and the David, the adulterer, he goes, yep, he had a heart after God. He had a pure heart. And he said, you know, do you think Peter had a pure heart? And I said to Peter, feed my sheep. I restored Peter. Do you, do you think Peter had a pure heart? He goes, you have one of the purest hearts. I do things for you, Todd Bentley, because of your heart, not your holiness. I provided your righteousness. Yeah, I made it a gift. Equal to salvation, I gave you the gift of righteousness. So I established the fact that you would never be righteous in your own self. But, you know, the one that ascends the hill of the Lord has to have a pure heart. He goes, heart is what I'm after. Heart is what I'm after. Do you have a heart of love, passion, fiery, intense? I wanted you. You know, do you have a heart that will repent quickly? Do you have a teachable heart? Do you have a humble heart? God will do things for the heart. He said, you have a pure heart. I was thinking of external moral and I was thinking, man, I wish I had a pure heart because I want to be a part of the glory generation in Psalms 24 that ascends the hill of the Lord and stands in the courts of the Lord. Boy, I wish I had holiness like Leonard Ravenhill. And the Lord said, you do. Just like David. And I thought, how could David have a pure heart and clean hands, right? And, and, and he really did. And the Lord said, he was a man after my own heart. Not that God excused behavior, but behavior doesn't change identity. We make the mistake of thinking behavior is identity. We need to separate what we do, behavior, from who we are in identity. Who you are is not what you do or not what you did. It's an amazing freedom that can come when you get free from labels and types and, you know, no longer identify with shame and being a victim and forgive yourself. So moving on, and the Lord said, the glory generation. And who are the glory generation in Psalms 24, verse 4 and 6? Who are they? It says they are the generation that seek God's face like Jacob. The generation of those committed to worship in the glory and purity and holiness. And because of their commitment to the holy courts, they have a purity and a holiness. And they literally are a generation of people that seek the face of God like Jacob. Well, how did Jacob seek the face of God? I will not let you go till you bless me. Because I need a new name. I need a new nature. Touch me. My walk needs to be different. My identity. I'm not going to let you go until I wrestle all night long until I'm a different person. We don't have a generation of people that seek the face of God like Jacob anymore. We're too busy seeking his hand and not his face. Not that you can't have his hand and face. 
You can't separate the hand and face of God, but you get the idea of the difference between seeking the face of God and seeking the hand of God. It can never just be about what's on my prayer list or the blessing. It has to be about I want to know you. Please show me your glory. That's what Moses wanted, the inner reality of who you are, your character, your nature, your attributes. And the Lord said, my glory is going to come. And when my glory comes, I'm going to manifest before you my character. And the first manifestation of my glory is going to be called, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Please show me your glory. And so the Lord did for Moses after he put him in the cleft of the rock. He said, you want to see my glory? Here's my glory. My goodness will pass before you. See the favor and the glory and the goodness of God? One and the same, right? I will make all my goodness. That's how God responded to, can I see the inner reality of who you are? And the Lord said, well, who I am manifest as goodness. Went about doing good, healing all those oppressed of the devil. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. All my goodness will pass before you. Then you know you have the glory. Then you know you have the glory. When you say, show me your glory, and I come and reveal my glory is my goodness, my forgiveness, my tender mercies, uh, my compassion. He didn't say anything about his judgment. Forgiving iniquities. That is the glory of God. So it's an amazing thing right now. The Lord is releasing this new white eagle, and he's talking about the emerging prophetic voice. He's speaking about a new prophetic mantle uh, coming down and uh, a new company of prophets that are going to be more committed to worship. They're going to be a glory generation committed to worship, and they're going to ascend the hill of the Lord, and they're going to have a, a purity that comes by the Spirit and a purifying that comes by the fire and the glory of God, and they're going to be trusted with the face-to-face -face revelation because they're going to be the generation that seek God and stand in his face and as God spoke to Moses, not in a dark saying, not in a parable, but face to face, God's going to begin to give the kind of face to face encounters to a whole new generation of prophetic people. And their stream will be on a different level than what we've called the prophetic in recent years because we're going to recognize the eagles. We're going to go, that's an eagle. That, that guy's got maturity and wisdom. And look how blue his eyes are. And he's got a purity, not a regurgitation. He is a voice, not an echo. And they're going to be signs and wonders prophets that do signs and wonders. We're not going to be limited to, well, the evangelists evangelize and the prophets prophesy. We're going to see the blending. And at the same time, the Lord told me, and I'll talk more about this tonight, he told me a new mantle of healing is falling, a new mantle of miracles is falling on the church. Somebody said, where's the double portion? That'll be tonight, talking about the double portion. But the double portion I'm talking about is a double portion prophetic and a double portion miracle mantle. Healing, Miracles, and then a new company of emerging prophetic people. We're going to see emerging miracle workers that are under 40. We're going to see emerging prophetic voices that are under 40. And they're going to have a purity about how they move in signs and wonders and a purity. They're going to bring their revelation from the face of God, not just from a dream or a vision or a parable. They're going to have another level of God trusting us with secrets because he shares secrets with friends. I'm hungry to be a part of the new company of emerging white eagles with blue eyes. How many of you are ready to be a part of a new mantle? It's time for a prophetic upgrade, a word of knowledge upgrade, supernatural upgrade. Not to be content with whatever you've been receiving already. Why not believe God? You should have an encounter. I haven't had an encounter with the Lord in a long time where I knew I was in His presence in a trance and it was a, not a very long kind of encounter, but it was so impacting to see the Lord giving out those nets. So, Lord, we desire today an open heaven. We desire today to be an emerging voice. I want to be a voice. I want to be a sound, not an echo. God, I want to be a part of the Isaiah 8.18 I and the children whom the Lord God has given me are for signs, wonders, and miracles. God, I want to see uh, uh, emerging miracle workers, not just gifts of healings, but miracle workers. I want to see emerging new generation miracle workers. And in many ways, it's coming connected to opening up the gates and the doors that the King of Glory may come in, right? That's Psalms 24. We're unlocking and opening up gates and doors so the King of Glory can come into cities. That's going to be with the worship. But it's a glory generation of those that are going to seek and know how to seek the face of God, not just the hand, but how to seek the face of God the way that Jacob did. 
And those that want to stand in the light of the king's face are going to receive the greatest revelation. And that's where the power and the authority and the miracles are really going to move. God, release those prophetic mantles. Ask him today. Lift your hands up. Say, Lord, I ask you for a fresh enabling of the prophetic in my life. I want to engage the revelatory, and I want there to be a new prophecy. I want there to be a new mantle upon my life of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom. I pray for wisdom. Lord, give me wisdom. What to do, when to do. How do I rightly apply revelation? Show me. Give me wisdom. I've got so many years of things that you've spoken to me and showed me already. Give me the blueprints and the patterns from heaven. Give me the strategic keys from heaven so I know how to build. God's given me strategies from old Bob Jones prophecies on how to build. That's the apostolic. There are strategies being released from heaven on how to see those old prophecies that we all love, Paul Cain prophecies. We all love the old prophetic words that are 20, 30 years, you know, preparing our prophetic glory movement for the stadium revival. But we must go beyond just prophesying and dreaming, and we must get intentional. What are we doing to book the venues? What are we doing to mobilize? What are we doing to put together uh, the, the teams, the, the cluster, hallelujah, if you would, Judah first? What are we doing to be intentional about grabbing a hold of the Judah, the Zebulun, and, and the seer? we got to go beyond just having a bunch of seers that see and pray. We've got to see our, our, the things that we're seeing manifest. So, Lord, I, I release and declare over the people of God today uh, new light in the womb for the birthing. I, de- I declare where there's been delay and warfare, robbing, even demonic assignments, I say there's new life in the womb. Wherever there's been death, wherever there's been miscarriage, wherever there's been delay, wherever there's been uh, a robbing of the womb, I pray the light of Christ would manifest for a new beginning, that the light of Christ would manifest, uh, bringing to pass uh, a, a grace in your life to enable you to see the unfulfilled visions and dreams. Lord, this is a a crossing over season. We are in the Feast of Booths. We are remembering what it was like in the desert, but we're done wandering. You see, that's what the Lord is highlighting. Are you remembering right now the spirit behind what I brought you out? And now the harvest of the whole year, but you need to know you're in a new beginning. And that the field is ready for the new planting. Everything that was in the field has been harvested. Now you're ready to plant the new planting. How many are ready for the new planting 2018-19, the new planting 2020, the new planting? You've got to embrace and press into the word that this is a double portion vision and a double portion birthing year right now. Hallelujah. It is a time of grace for the double seven seven, bringing us into the nine, which has to do with apostolic government. God is putting things in order. Nine is a number for government. You know, the, the government of God is upon his shoulder, Isaiah 9 6. I'm telling you, apostolic government is coming to the prophetic because God is building with, with apostles and prophets. So we've had such a prophetic, but we need a little bit more establishing. We need a little bit more governmental strategic keys so that we can see these 26 years of unfulfilled prophetic words manifest in our lives. I'm convinced God's not sitting up in heaven going, here's 30 more years of stadium prophecy so one day you can get ready for the billion soul harvest. Where is there going to be a generation that hears the word of the Lord, hears the words of Moses, and tells the generation, hey, in three days we're going to go in and take this word of that's the permission the Lord's given me right now. He said, anything you could find that Bob Jones prophesied connected to, you know, harvest, you can have. Because Bob gave you that anointing. Most people don't know how to wage a good warfare with the prophecies. Most of us don't know how to go out and possess what's not ours because we heard what God said over a city or through another voice. And we wished it was to us, but it wasn't. And then even those unfulfilled words you already have or dreams you don't understand, you're like, when, God? There's something about the apostolic and the spirit of wisdom being released right now so you could know how to rightly apply, position yourself to be in the breakthrough. So God's shifting you from just the need for more prophetic revelation to the need for for wisdom and apostolic added to your prophetic. So I, I command the shift right now in your life, and I, I pray that the spirit of wisdom would be imparted to you, not just the spirit of revelation. I pray the spirit of wisdom would be imparted to you, that blueprints and strategies and keys would be released from heaven right now so you would know how to unlock and pull down 26 years of words, okay? You need to look back over your personal words and go, I hear and remember all the words of Moses, but God right now is moving throughout 
built the camp. And he's saying, listen, this feast of ingathering is about the fact that Israel remembers what it was like to be in tents, but I brought them into the land of promise. I am faithful to bring you into the land of promise and inheritance. You must remember that in this window and season. And you must embrace the new beginning that we've come into right now. So I declare over you the manifestation of favor when it comes to seeing God move through your life, releasing his unfulfilled promises. Light is manifesting in your supernatural womb. Give the Lord a mighty shout for that. Lord, release the Joseph, release the double fruitfulness, Ephraim, release the Manasseh cluster, but Lord, release the Judah and release the Zebulun, hallelujah, and release the Seir cluster. How many want to see a new cluster of anointings like praise in Judah and new clusters of anointing like uh, Zebulun and wealth in heaven's economy connected to a new resource uh, so that the revelatory anointing can connect in to the wealth anointing? That means revelation is going to be key to unlocking wealth. The seer anointing is key to unlocking the Zebulun. How many are praying for the wealth tribe in your life? God, connect my gift. Listen, if you are a seer, you need to pray as a seer, God connects you to wealth. You need to pray as an evangelist, God connects you to wealth. You need to pray that God connects you to gifts that aren't yours, that, that help make up the fullness of what God's doing. You need to depend upon gifts that God has placed, abilities and talents, so that they can make up the weakness that you have because nobody has the fullness of anything. You know, We all are dependent upon what each person carries. But to recognize right now that there is a clustering together of, of certain anointings, and we want to see that cluster bomb, the new wine is in the cluster. I want to see the cluster of the Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim. I want to see the cluster, hallelujah, of, of the Zebulun wealth tribe connected together with Judah and connected together with the seer. I want to see the seers prosper. Can I say that? That the, you know, How many of you know that, that we only prosper when we obey the, 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 the prophesying of the prophets? The Bible says you'll prosper when you obey the prophesying of the prophets, when it's a real true word. How many of you would like to see a new prospering with Revelation? You're tired of the prophetic word falling to the wayside. You're tired of all the, the people that seem to be seers or have a lot of revelation, but they don't have any financial connection. So may God connect your seer to your Zebulun. God always partners. Jesus had many women that ministered to him out of their substance. God knew how to partner a group of women around Jesus that knew how to open up the treasure box and pay for stuff. Now, it was unfortunate that Judah had to oversee the box, but, you know, but the Bible says many women were provided for to minister to Jesus out of their substance. Now, how offensive is that today, that it was women that God had ordained? Man, I thought, I said to my wife one time, I said, see, it's the will of God that many women travel and minister out of their substance. Hallelujah. I've always been a mama's boy, and I always tend to have all the ladies around, you know, and uh, like mothers, you know, type, and, you know, not talking young ladies. Uh, but I said, Lord, God has ordained these moms, you know, to minister to me out of their substance. They make me food, and they bring me gifts, and, you know, coffee, and sometimes they give me money, and they're like moms, you know. And, uh, it's amazing. I have a whole company of these ladies, and they feel they're called to be a mom in my life and uh, pay for things and pay for harvest. And I always found that interesting because, you know, I thought I would have many fathers or many, you know, sons, and I end up having many daughters, and the Lord ordains me in the ministry on Mother's Day and, you know, gives me a word about the daughters of destiny and women on the front line. And I said, God, what is that? Every major revival I've had happens in and around Mother's Day, and, you know, you visit me on Mother's Day, and I thought, why not Father's Day? I mean, that's what I really need. I got all kinds of things that I need to be healed with my father, but you're doing a mother thing. And so, um, anyways, I don't know why I said all that, but how many of you are ready to see the new birthing in your life? Uh, praise God. So, Lord, release that anointing of grace, 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 ability, empowerment coming to you right now for you to cross over. Nothing can be in the way. When you understand what season it is, what time it is, it's the harvest season. And, the, and it'll be harvest as long as the banks are flooding. God, flood my banks. How many can pray for the banks to flood? In your church, the banks to flood. That's why it's got to go from ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, Ezekiel 37. It's got to be a river so deep you can't cross but have to swim. Some of us aren't even near the flood yet. The waters aren't high enough. Lord, those, those, the white eagle. Anybody hungry to be a part of that new company of emerging voices? Miracle workers. I'll talk about the miracle worker mantle tonight. 
specifically, the healing mantle, the miracle mantle tonight. But we're going to receive a double portion of the prophetic and a double portion of the healing mantle. That's what I'm going to be praying for tonight. And I'll be talking about Elisha and Elijah and how Elisha received his second mantle, literally a second mantle. How many are ready for your second mantle? You heard me talk about how the Lord gave me the evangelist, and then years later he came and he said, here's the, a prophet's mantle. I never thought you could have more than one mantle. And then years after that, the Lord came and he said, I got another mantle, but you have to grow into this one. I said, what is that, a third mantle? He said, yeah, this is called the apostle. I've called you as an apostolic person, and you're going to grow into this one. You're going to father a generation of leaders, and you're going to harvest harvesters, and you're going to be the greatest equipping evangelist. Start now at 40. Don't wait till you're 90. He goes, that's why you need to pray for double portion. That's why you need to be as concerned about the equipping and the making disciples as you are making converts and going into the world and preaching. You need to be as committed to both. Evangelists are in the church to train and equip the church, to mobilize thousands and thousands of harvesters to do what I do in the fields and the stadiums. So if I could impact, you know, another thousand harvesters that want to do stadiums, that would be more impacting than all the stadiums that I'm doing. So when I'm in the church, I'm, I'm equipping and I'm trying to move you and pray that the Lord of the harvest would thrust you out into the fields. You know, that, that's a violent word. Thrust you means send you, the Lord of the harvest. Who sends you? The Lord of the harvest. And what does he send you? He thrusts you out. How many of you are ready to be thrust out? Like shot out of a cannon. <laughs> Shoot. That's the word thrust. Pray the Lord of the harvest to shoot you out. Why? Because we don't get moving without being, you know, shot out sometimes. God's shooting you out into nations. God's shooting you out like an arrow into the nations. Say, shoot me out, God. Thrust me out. He, the Lord of the harvest is thrusting you out of the nest. He's throwing you out of the eagle's nest because you've been in there way too long, and you better use those wings and start flying. Are you just going to flop on the ground, oh, eagle? <laughs> You fell right out of that eagle's nest and didn't do anything with those wings. You know, hallelujah. It's time to get moving. Use those wings. Thrust me out. Launch me out. And, and, and what are we doing? Pray. It's amazing the coming together of the prayer and the worship, right? Pray that the Lord of the harvest send out laborers. We can preach about the need for evangelism, but if we don't pray... That's why the prayer movement is so key to what's coming in missions because the, the pray, the Lord of the harvest, would thrust out laborers, thrust out harvesters. we got to pray. And we got to understand that there will be no generation that will be awesome in the prophetic word if they're not a worship glory generation that knows who are to ascend the courts of the Lord. We must have that Psalms 24 generation that seeks the face of God like Jacob did and is more concerned about being in the face of God than just all the other stuff. There is another level of purity coming for the emerging prophetic voice that's saying, God, release the white eagles with blue eyes. Release the ministries of maturity and wisdom that will bring the pure word manifest with signs, wonders, and miracles. And God, we pray that the emerging miracle workers, wait till I get to that one tonight. God may drop on you a second or a third mantle. Do you know Elisha in the Bible literally received two mantles? Not only a double portion, he literally got two mantles. Some of you are ready to pick up your first mantle. Some of you are ready for your second mantle. Some of you are ready for God to bring an upgrade. Do you know what the upgrade is? Somebody said, where's that in the Bible? God upgrading your gift. What did God call Saul and the kings? You know, when kings go to war, he would say, anoint the shield. Anoint the shield. Bring the oil, bring the wine, bring it to the shield. Anoint the shield. Don't get a new shield. You're going to make what you already have stronger. You're going to put a fresh new wine and a fresh new oil on your shield. And it'll be stronger than a new shield. It's like getting a new pair of boots. Who wants to break them in? But when they're worn in, Sometimes you don't need new shoes, you just need new oil because they already fit well when they're broken in. I don't like new shoes. I don't like new boots. I like God to do something and make something fresh and new out of something I already know how to use, something that I already fit. Some of you are always trying to get new gifts, new whatever, new calls, new, and God just wants to bring an upgrade. How many of you could use a prophetic upgrade? You're already prophetic. How many of you could use a healing upgrade? You already got healing. How many could use a word of knowledge upgrade? You already got the word of knowledge. But some of you don't have it fresh. You don't have new wine and oil. 
So tonight is going to be fresh new wine, fresh new oil. That's why I love announcing in advance to help build people's faith up for the impartation meeting. So I don't just go through these things lightly where I'm going to pray over everybody that you would receive a double portion of what I've received from the Lord in most recent you know, months. The Lord gave me a word about praying double portion, to be intentional about praying double portion, the mantle I've received, that God would impart that to the next generation. So I'm praying for that tonight at seven. Give the Lord a mighty shout for that. We're going to have an Elisha, Elijah anointing meeting. So you guys could get lunch, of course. I'm going to be here if you're not here tonight and you haven't been here Friday and Saturday and you're a part of the Glory Bound ministry team and family and you've missed out on all the ministry over the weekend and you can't be here tonight. I don't want anyone to leave without getting ministry for healing specifically. So if you are here, I'm going to open the altar and invite anybody to come forward to get prayer that's not got prayer Friday and Saturday, can't be here tonight, and you're just, this is my church, and I'm glad I was able to get in on this one meeting. Todd, could you pray for me? Yes, I can. I want you to come up to the front. We're going to have a line so shoulder to shoulder, standing before the Lord, okay, and so that'll be you. If you want to, uh, you know, take a break, uh, Claudia, Wyatt, if you have anything to say, you know, uh, housekeeping, uh, we have the bookstore open for about 15 minutes. If you want to check out the resources, I will get back there and sign books and CDs tonight, so shop around. Again, who could you bless in the community that may not know a lot of what we teach and preach and you want to introduce our ministry? Start with the secret place. It's a great tool to bring to a leader, to a pastor, to somebody in your family or whatnot, so Leslie will be back there in our team. I think they have coffees and drinks, but I want people to come forward right now that want personal ministry that are part of the Glory Bound family and community that haven't been able to be here and receive what's been released this weekend already. I want you to come forward and uh, we invite you to bring out family, friends, let them know about tonight's special double portion anointing meeting and why they don't want to miss it. Uh, but go ahead and who's hungriest? So go ahead and come forward real quick if you're here this morning and I want to minister to you. So I want to pray for healing. I want to pray for deliverance. I want to pray for impartation. Uh, uh, for those that have not received any ministry and uh, you don't plan on being here tonight, just go ahead and stand before me. Uh, stand before the Lord, shoulder to shoulder. Just come on down. Uh, the water is good. Jump into the deep end of the pool, guys. Uh, get some lunch this afternoon. Praise God. Get drunk here in the Holy Ghost. And then, uh, you know, go and spend all your money when you're drunk. It's the best time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on up real quick. Last minute. You better get down here if you're coming for prayer. Get in this line, guys. Shoulder to shoulder. And uh, just start entering in and praying. Just start focusing, connecting your heart, connecting your heart to the Lord, connecting your mind to the Lord. Thank you, by the way, Glory Bound, for being so generous and praying for us and loving us. And thank you for those that have given to our ministry. Uh, just Can we give the Lord a mighty shout for that? Some of you have been really generous. Thank you. Got a few more coming. Get in this line real quick. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, tonight, I'll tell you, you're going to wish you were here. So if you pray about it and you're like, man, maybe I should go back after I have a Pentecostal nap or snooze, you are welcome to come back. But come ready and expecting that you're coming to get a double portion mantling. Really think about that. There's something about expectation in receiving, isn't there? Faith isn't always the answer. Expectation, the earnest expectation that good things are coming. Hope is an important key to receiving faith. We think it's build my faith, get more faith. Some of us need to get more hope. What is hope? The earnest expectation, expecting that good things are going to fall on me today. What is faith? It's the substance. Faith brings the substance of things earnestly hoped for. Some of you forgot the hope part. You got faith, but you don't got the hope part. So expecting that when I lay hands on you, you're going to receive is key to receiving. Expectancy that good things are coming. Divine turnaround is coming. New beginnings is coming. Recovery is coming. Restoration is coming. The eyes of man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You must think new beginnings. You must think crossing over. You must think possessing the promise. You must think pulling down the inheritance. You must, uh, you know, and I'm not responsible to make that happen. Holy Spirit is. You're responsible to make that happen through how you connect in with Holy Spirit. Somebody got in my prayer line one time and said, pray for me for healing. I did. They didn't get healed. And they looked at me and they said, I'm still in pain. I said, that's your skepticism, not mine. I said, you're looking at me as the reason you're still in pain. And you want me to pray a second and third time like I'm the healer. That's why you're not being healed. Because your eyes aren't on Jesus. They're on me. And you're blaming me for the pain you still have. Why should I pray twice or three times when you really aren't using your own faith? 
There's something said about connecting in with your own faith and taking upon the responsibility that you're connected in the process of receiving the miracle. Because all of us are just these vessels, right? So this is why I encourage people to get in my prayer lines. I encourage them in prayer. I encourage them in worship. I encourage that by the time I'm praying in this prayer line, you should already be so caught up in the glory. But by the time I get down to you, you forget that I'm even here praying. Because that's the only way you're really going to receive. And what is it you're believing for? Where are you putting your expectation? Where are you putting your faith? Where are you connecting in? What, what assignment? Come, Holy Spirit. I'm so hungry. I'm going after this thing. I want this new mantle in my life. So i got to start over here praying. I'm just going to lay hands on people and say, Lord, you're just imparting stuff. You're releasing healing. God, you're bringing grace and ability to step in uh, to the new season. Uh, God, how? Oh, fresh grace. New grace. New grace. Grace is empowerment, right? It's power. Power. How many of you need power that's going to help you overcome circumstance and situation? Because it's not always easy to get through the battle to possess. You've got to drive out all the enemies, right? So is there a deposit of the grace of God coming in our lives called grace, 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 grace? Bring it forth the capstone with shouts of grace, 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 grace. An empowerment, an ability that's going to enable us to, to advance quickly. How many of you want to advance in the kingdom quickly? Oh, so I just releasing. It's like I'm anointing you to step into 5779. I'm anointing you for the new beginning. Anointing you for the new beginning. Whoa, Lord, anoint them for the new beginning. Right now, bam, right now, bam, right there. Holy Ghost anointing for the new beginning. Empowerment, abilities, hallelujah. God, give out inheritances, mantles, double portion. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for grace, for healing being released right now. There's power. Holy Spirit is given through the laying on of hands. What happens when Holy Spirit breaks in, when the kingdom of God comes into our life? The kingdom of God right now, Father, the kingdom. I take authority over everything that's contrary to kingdom, and I release and declare as it is. Let it be as it is in heaven right now in your life. As it is in heaven, that divine order, the way that it is in heaven, it's going to be that way. The way that it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Ho! Oh, your kingdom come, let it be on earth as it is in heaven right now. Oh, connect him with heaven. Hey, connect him with heaven's blessing and breakthrough. Hey, heaven's glory and grace. Oh, heaven's glory and grace. Beauty. Shaka bam. The glory, glory. Love the beauty. I love the glory of God. Heavy, weighty God. You, you've been speaking to me about uh, an Isaiah 8 generation, Awaken 818. I'm actually going to be holding a big youth conference uh, called Awaken 818. It's to awaken a generation of signs, wonders, and miracles, a merging generation that are going to be marked and set apart to be a sign and a wonder. Not just do signs and wonders, but these uh, Isaiah 818 are going to be signs and wonders in Israel. So this generation are the emerging signs and wonders in Israel. So we're marking the next generation to move in the mantle. Bam. Awaken them. Awaken them, God. <sighs> bam, 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 bam. Glory to God. There it is. Double, Holy Spirit. Double, double. Let that anointing be released. Let that new emerging voice. Oh, God, the prophets of purity, power, authority. Friend to friend revelation. Friend to friend revelation with God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Let the move of God begin. I pray for the move of God. Floods in your life. Floods of Holy Spirit. Floods. Welcome the floods of Holy Spirit. Welcome the full immersion, Holy Spirit, full immersion, floods, the rivers of God being floods in your life. The harvest time season. <sighs> Lord, anoint us for the harvest time season. Breakthrough, 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 breakthrough. You see, when, when David encountered the spirit of breakthrough, the angel that came the second time, the angel, the wind blowing in the top of the mulberry trees, remember that? The, the word of the Lord was when, when the angel, the breaker, when the wind is blowing, then you shall advance quickly. So sometimes it takes the, the Judah first or the angels blowing in the trees. We open it up, and then the Lord says advance and take all the land and ground and quickly. So there's going to be an acceleration, taking a lot of ground and seeing victory. No more delay. The promise of God, no more delay. And so, Lord, let them take and move and advance. Take new ground, new territory. Take back the land. Take back everything the enemy's stolen, you see. But God's speaking about advancing forward. Second Kings or Second Samuel 5, the breaker angel. 
angel shows up in 2 Samuel 5. And the second breakthrough is when the angels of the wind blowing on the top of the mulberry trees. And then the Lord said, you shall go out against your enemy and circle in around them and advance quickly. The kingdom shall advance quickly in your life. So you're taking these steps forward, not backwards. Not five steps forward, three steps back. You're going to go back and you're not going to look back. You're going to go forward and not look back. And uh, so the Lord's doing something with enabling you to cut free from some past stuff and not be entangled anymore and, and take steps forward and not have to look in the rearview mirror. Uh, so God's bringing that kind of freedom. I don't know what that means, but uh, hallelujah, bam. No more, uh, you know, being entangled or snared with past things. There's no more like hooks or ropes. I see that r real freedom there. So, Lord, release the breaker anointing. I prophesy in the supernatural winds of breakthrough and the breaker anointing in your life out of 2 Samuel 5. And I'm declaring that Baal Perazim, the master of breakthroughs, is upon you now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a mighty shout. He's awesome. Get some lunch, guys. Get back here for 7 o'clock tonight. Um, if you go, haven't got to the book tables yet, do that. Come early tonight. You want to bring uh, books, CDs. If you want me to sign something, there is some awesome T-shirts back there as well. Uh, we'll see you tonight. Pastor uh, Mary. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We'll see you tonight at um, 7 o'clock. Please come and bring everyone with you. It's going to be an outstanding time. Uh, do you want to step in there, Todd? I okay. think they have something for you right there.